Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and moderate this session, uh, which is our first session of the day for the Berlin Demography Day's focus on Europe. So our, this session is named Younger People's Voice in Politics and is structured in the following way. So first, we are going to hear a keynote, and then this, this presentation will be followed by some words by a discussant. And in the third step, there will be panelists joining the, the conversation. So I hope you, you enjoy. And if you have questions, you can freely post the question in the Q&A using the Q&A function. So I, I won't prolong myself. I'd just like to give the floor to Miriam Alam. She is Senior Economist at OECD's Public Governance and Territorial Development Directorate, which is part of the Regulatory Policy Division. Miriam, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, and I would like to actually uh, share my screen uh, to because um, I have some slides to share. I don't know if it works. Voila. Great. Well, uh, well, let me uh, take a moment uh, uh, to thank the organizers for the kind invitation, and in particular you, uh, Andreas, for for reaching out to the OECD. Um, in, my, in my presentation, I will focus on the participation of uh, young people in both public and uh, political life, as both, as you know, are deeply interrelated. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will provide comparative evidence collected across uh, the OEC 38 member countries, and I will address why participation is actually not a nice uh, to have, but a must have, especially now in the recovery but also in light of uh, what uh, Christian was saying about global challenges such as climate change, population aging, and the threats to democratic institutions, which we have seen in uh, many countries. The evidence that I'm presenting is drawn mainly from our latest publication that you see on that slide, um, the uh, Governance for Youth, Trust, and Intergenerational Justice, where we ask if governments are actually fit for all generations. And uh, the evidence is also um, drawn from the latest COVID paper. Um, I'm really pleased to, uh, to announce that the insights uh, that, uh, that, we are, that I'm presenting supported also the elaboration of the first legal instrument uh, of the OECD on youth empowerment, which will be presented to our ministerial council meeting on 9th and 10th of June. And if uh, approved, then of course, Germany as an OECD member countries will have to adhere to that. Uh, international standard. To understand why participation is so important, let me uh, point to some of the impacts of the COVID crisis on youth. Uh, as you know, the pandemic is now the second shock after the global uh, crisis, the uh, global financial crisis from 2009, eight, from 2008, sorry, uh, where, uh, so the second shock within less than two decades. And evidence from the financial crisis suggests that such events events will leave long lasting scars on young people, mental health opportunities to find affordable housing, uh, as well as career paths and future earnings. These impacts are more pronounced for young people living in vulnerable circumstances and OECD estimates shows that a lost school year can lead to a loss of between seven and 10% of lifetime earnings income. This is really severe. But beyond social and economic and health impacts, the crisis may also have a lasting impact on young people's trust in government and their satisfaction with democracy. And both are strong rationals for prioritizing participation of young people in public and political life. I will show you uh, a slide, sorry, of young people's trust in national government as of 2021. And although the situation varies across countries, and Germany actually is doing not that bad, you see that uh, across OECD countries, less than 50% of young people trusted their government in 21. This is also confirmed in a um, survey among youth organizations. And I'm very happy that Janis is on the panel today because they have participated in this survey that the OECD has conducted last year, and they come to a similar conclusion that trust during the pandemic has actually declined, as well as the satisfaction with democracies, as you can see here. When asked about the reason for decline in trust, use organization pointed to two factors, low level of satisfaction with the delivery of public services, 
but also lack of opportunities to shape recovery measures. Here again, why it is so important to give young people the voice. In the context of low levels of trust and political polarization on the rise, these findings must be taken seriously. Without trust, no policy, no reform will be sustainable enough to build the future that our citizens want. The ability and perception of having a say in politics and satisfaction with public services is also two out of three drivers the OECD has identified as shaping trust in government. And in fact, and I think that's a really positive call, in fact, our analysis shows when youth organizations are involved systematically in the policymaking cycle, they express higher satisfaction with performance of government in delivering uh, public services, as you can see here, here on this slide. Participation, uh, barriers of participation nonetheless remain high. I'm sure you have discussed it yesterday on the side of the government in our survey. It became very clear that uh, government officials perceive the lack within the ministries of engaging with young people as one of the most severe barriers. In fact, 32% of the respondents pointed to, to that. But on the other side of the fence, when you ask young people, there's also strong hesitating, hesitation to, to get engaged because usually these consultation uh, exercises are perceived as tick box exercises and governments are asking youth only to legitimize their action. But again, engaging pays off. And if done meaningfully, uh, uh, then um, as we have seen, it has actually very high returns for both. When it comes to the representation in state institution and in politics, we see that young people are less likely uh, to join political parties and to participate in elections and older groups. They also are underrepresented in state institution, as you can see here on this slide. For instance, uh, in some countries, we are talking about less than 5% of the central government workforce that is below 35%. Germany uh, in uh, 2015 still had 30%. There's a massive drop from 2015 to 2020 to about 70% of the workforce below 35 in central government. But uh, furthermore, on average across OECD, only 22% of members of parliament are younger than 40. This is not to argue, and I think that's an extremely important point, this is not to argue that the more uh, younger people you have in the government workforce or in politics, the more you also have advocates for youth concerns. The argument is rather the more diverse your public administration uh, in, and your um, uh, government workforce and the parliament is, the more representative uh, it is also of the people, obviously, and the better your policy outcomes, as shown in various studies. So placing young people and their perspective at the center of public life requires efforts to break silos. Um, and, uh, and here I would like to really show the added value also of two things, which are uh, strategies, use national use strategies, and the growing trend also of innovative public management tools to bring in a uh, age length. Um, when you look at uh, youth strategies, well, this is one possible way for uh, to unite different ministries that are holding a stake in youth concerns, agencies and non-governmental stakeholders to join them behind a government-wide vision to support young people. Um, and we have seen in OECD countries a rising trend in these youth strategies, among them also Germany that has adopted it uh, two years ago. 76% of OECD countries have such a strategy, but only, and I think that's really important, only 20% of these strategies are fully participatory. That means they were uh, elaborated with the involvement of young people. Only 20% are budgeted and monitored and evaluated as well. At the same time, our assessment shows that there's a positive relation, correlation between countries that perform well in having a meaningful youth strategy that is not only a piece of paper, but it is really was done in a participatory uh, way. And, uh, the, and the interest of young people in politics. Again, having a more inclusive approach pays off. At the OECD, when it comes to public management tools, we have also seen a number of government initiatives to adopt uh, a more integrated age perspective in decision-making and public budgeting. I give you some examples. For instance, in the Netherlands, the Netherlands have adopted a so-called generation check to assess how draft 
policies or laws may impact different generations. In Germany, you do have the use checks on draft laws. In the Netherlands, you have this for across uh, age groups. Um, in New Zealand, New Zealand integrates an intergenerational length into the budget uh, cycle through what they call well-being budget, which was introduced for the first time in 2019, and which also sheds light on the distributional effects of budget allocation across uh, age cohorts. You also have in some countries dedicated bodies um, um, to monitor commitments of future generations. Uh, for instance, in Wales, they have established a future generation uh, commission. They have even a future generation commissioner that is tasked with advising public bodies on inter integrating a long-term perspective in policy making. In, uh, in Italy, they have established just recently a interparliamentary a uh, group to uh, look also at intergenerational concerns when it comes to the recovery. Uh, what we have seen also is, um, and that's very important, um, uh, uh, constitutions that are enshrining the rights of future generations. So in fact, nine, nine countries in the OECD have an explicit reference to that, to, to clauses related to general ecological or financial matters that will concern future generations. Governments can also strengthen young people's voice in decision making through targeted consultation mechanisms. 53% of OECD countries have advisory youth council affiliated to government or specific ministries. In Denmark, for instance, you have the Ministry of uh, uh, Environment that has established the Youth Climate Council, which advises the ministry in areas of climate change, environmental protection, farming and uh, food production. Uh, in the discussion later, we will probably also talk about voting age um, and also quotas, etc. But let me really just uh, summarize that embedding youth, young people's perspective in policy making in politics is not a must have, but it is essential to create trust and have better policies for better <coughs> age. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miriam. This has been outstanding, super interesting presentation. And I'm very curious to hear the comments of our discussant, Mr. Janis, uh, Janis, Janis Fifka, who is member of the governing body of the European Youth Parliament in Berlin. Janis, the floor is yours. Hear me properly. Uh, thank you very yes. much. Ms. Alam, uh, for uh, the introduction and the presentation, I think a lot of the points that were given highlight uh, what are already given opportunities for governments um, and institutions to take action. And actually, I would uh, like to react to the uh, to one of the uh, points that were put in the chat uh, to also start off my my commentary. Um, uh, someone uh, wrote there that they feel like, uh, why are we talking about generations um, if we're only focusing this panel now about youth? And I would say or react to this that we haven't focused on youth for a very long, long time. And we have just proven with the pandemic that we we're still haven't understood that it is necessary to do so. Mm, one of the graphics that uh, Ms. Alam showed with the numbers of people involved in institutions and so on, it showed very clearly that we're not even uh, fulfilling or covering the 25% um, that, for example, in Europe, young people are making up from the population. Um, of course, you cannot really measure the amount of um, decisions or the amount of ideas that young people bringing into the system is it 25 percent is it 36 percent is it less but overall i think we haven't we have an issue uh, with how young people are represented in um in decision making overall uh, especially as we have a lot of cross cutting uh, cutting issues here i would like to um give two uh, short overviews on what I think uh, needs of young people are and needs of youth organizations are. Um, we as, an, uh, as the European Youth Parliament, we are um, an educational program. We are reaching up to 30,000 young people all over Europe. And we are not, we are not a political organization. However, we are, we are involving a lot of young people in events where they 
um, show their op um, opinions and where they get the chance to talk to other young people. So I think we have quite a good overview of what are uh, potential needs and what should be structurally changed. And um, I think in, in one point about young people are definitely that we need a more broader definition of outreach and inclusion efforts, uh, looking at abilities, financial, social language, uh, and other factors. Because uh, especially also now with the COVID pandemic, we have seen that there are new social disparities uh, despite some of positive aspects and some positive efforts of, of governments. Um, we need a continuation on increase of mobility programs. We need um, a, a recognition of the digital age now as an opportunity, but not as a cheap and easy fast fix for, for youth involvement or youth um, exchange. We need uh, a better interconnectedness of programs uh, that are, are of importance in pan during the pandemic, but beyond. Uh, we need a better space for participation and actual implementation of the EU youth goals. And we need to have a, a systemic change uh, where young uh, people and youth organizations are the cat uh, catalysts. And I think some of the uh, examples that uh, were given, for example, with the youth strategies or with um, uh, efforts of governments to look at uh, young people's interest uh, over, over all the policy areas, over all the ministries is very much important. And uh, to shift it also to youth organizations, what can we do or how can we play a role? I mean, we are, I would say much better probably sometimes with reaching out to young people and knowing what they need and, and uh, engaging them. Um, there are manifold factors that put huge pressure on, on uh, or such organizations such as social, the, the social dimension, we, we have to look at the participatory dimension, also the adaption to this new normality was very heavy on, on the shoulders of, of um, youth uh, uh, organizations. Mm, we have in a lot of countries in Europe, but also in OECD overall, issues with civic space and independence of youth organizations. Uh, we need a much more flexible organizational and policy setup where youth organizations are uh, on an eye level with, with other actors and that there is structural funding so that they are actually also able to live up to the expectations that are put on them by the governments, but also by young people. And this is uh, ultimately uh, calling for co-decision mechanisms and uh, uh, co-decision mechanisms also in terms of agenda setting. If you already have a very fixed uh, agenda given by governments and then young people are only asked to say what you like from these things that we put here on the agenda, that's not really um, uh, co-decision making. Uh, so young people's interests need to leave the shadow, let's say, and we need to um, ultimately come to cross-cutting approaches that really put young people, but in connection, of course, also the interests of other generations into, into the spotlight. I think as of now, and when we're looking at demo demographics and the demographic py pyramid, uh, the young people are really much in, um, yeah, forgotten often. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yanis. This is very, very interesting. Miriam, would you like to say some words before I invite the panelists to discuss? No, I think the, the point from, from um, uh, Yanis in particular about um, uh, supporting a, um, a structured approach towards consultation is extremely important. Uh, it's really not a matter of um, pointing the finger of what is going right and what is going wrong, but it's really to, to see youth and also youth organization as a partner that can contribute to what we call in the OECD evidence-based policy making. By no means, this means that uh, youth uh, uh, input should be, uh, uh, you know, just taken one by one, but it's really there to help governments coming to a more coherent and also a more comprehensive um, uh, perspective of the issue at, at stake. And I think that's uh, extremely important to bear in mind too. Thank you. So I would like to invite now our panelists to join the conversation. We have outstanding panelists in this group today. And I ask you please to turn on your cameras. Uh, we have Jana Hainsworth. She is the Secretary General of Eurochild, which is an organization based in Brussels. 
We have Dominique Kirstoffer, who is Managing Director of the European Future Forum, which is based in Vienna. We have uh, Jens Duben, who is the chairperson of Volt Germany. And we have Petros Fasolas, who is the secretary general of the European Movement International, also based in Brussels. So welcome to the discussion. We are very much looking forward to your insights. Perhaps Jana, you can start. Thank you very much, Danielle, and good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for the presentation, Miriam, and inputs, um, Yanis. So <clears throat> I guess my input is very much posing the, the question or the comment that healthy democracies and participation in public and democratic life doesn't start at voting age. It starts in, in childhood. And childhood experience very much shapes how we can participate in public and democratic life. So for, for, for us as a, a children's rights network with members all across Europe, we are fighting for the recognition that children are individual rights holders as a fundamental pillar of how we build healthy, resilient democracies. And if we look at the situation of children across Europe or, or also in the impact of COVID, the negative impact and the levels of poverty, social exclusion, the fact that children are very often the first victims of crises of war, very often victims of violence and abuse. There are many ways and many interventions that we need to do to protect children, but protection in and of itself does not help children recover and build resilience. So it's all about children's participation. It's about enabling children to have a say in decisions that are made about them, with them, from the earliest moment in life. Because only when you can connect with an individual's sense of their own agency and their own control over their life, can they then begin to feel trust and engagement with, with their communities, with decisions that are taken more widely. So this needs to happen first and foremost in families, secondly, within schools, within um, leisure, cultural, all these sorts of centers where children are, are participating and then in community life. And we've seen many really useful and valuable initiatives coming out across Europe now of involving children themselves in public decision-making, local town councils, municipalities. Um, and, and what is very important for us is how do we make those inclusive of all children and making sure that children do not carry victimhood into adulthood because that's where you start getting challenges of otherness, discrimination, mistrust, disaffection with institutions. So it needs to be addressed within childhood and that's about how are we, how are all adults that are working with and for children taking a child rights perspective, giving them the right to be them fully themselves, to work through and um, to, to not hold on to trauma, which many children have experienced. So ha and how can they then become agents, not only of agents of change in their own lives, but agents of positive agents of change in their communities um, and in society at large. So I think that there are very many positive trends of, of, and it's not just about lowering voting age. I think we need to move away from thinking that lowering voting age is about is, is democratizing the, the participation of children in, in democratic life. It's absolutely not just lowering voting age. It's about how do, our, how do we practice democracy in schools and in places where children are to enable them to learn what their, what their rights and their obligations are vis-a-vis -vis, um, having agency in their, in their lives, in their communities. I'll stop here. I'm sure the conversation will move on. I'd like to contribute later. Oh, fascinating. Thank you so much, Jana. Uh, I would like just to make a, a remark or for the flow of this conversation. So uh, I will now um, ask all the, uh, the panelists and, uh, and uh, keynote and discuss and to simply raise your hand when you want to jump in so I can immediately call you and then we make this more a flowing conversation. So Jens, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Jana just uh, said. Um, it's not really about uh, lowering the voting age, but rather about how do we get 
institutions, politicians, and so on, how do we get them to care for people who did not pass the voting age yet? So, I mean, we kind of have the issue that um, young people are, or I mean, young adults are already quite few people um, considering the, the voting population. So that's an issue, but the population that has not reached the voting age yet is, is even more at a disadvantage. So um, I think I think that's that's quite the important um, important thing that we that we need to talk about. So um, I think that loss loss of uh, distrust in um, institutions and in national governments will probably even be amplified um, concerning European institutions, European governments. Um, so, for example, if I think that. Um, in Germany, that uh, the national government is not performing a good job, and um, then maybe the distrust toward the European government will be, or the EU in this case, will be um, even even bigger, um, since it's quite transparent for many people. Many people don't, or many many younger people don't really know um, how it works. And I think that um, if we want to raise participation and interest. Um, we kind of have to take the institutions in the first place. So the European institutions have to be um, equal among all of Europe. So in all the um, nations um, of the EU, for example, um, we just talked about voting rights. Voting rights need to be equalized in the first place before before we start um, before we start uh, lowering them in, in individual countries. So I totally agree that the voting age should be lowered to 16, but. Um, on the other hand, uh, it needs to be done in all across Europe, and um, we have a long way to go concerning uh, concerning trust. And that starts probably with transparency and with participation within the European institutions, um, which is what we kind of uh, fight for on a European level. So I can kind of offer a uh, political approach here as uh, one of the, the few representatives of, of a European party in this panel. Thank you so much, Dominique, it's your turn now. Thank you, yes, uh, lots of points to uh, discuss and, and uh, respond to. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do everything since I've been told to keep my remarks short. Um, very briefly, I'm Austrian, so we've had a voting age of 16 uh, and up for a very long time. I, I grew up with it and I can tell you that it does make a difference uh, because it transports the political discourse uh, into schools. We were in high school when we got our first vote. And as a result, everyone in high school was talking about the elections, what our voting intentions were. Dominique, I apologize. As I, I need to interrupt you. I cannot see you. Oh. Like you suddenly disappeared from the screen. My, my bad. I don't know why. Maybe it's the virtual background. I'll turn it off. Uh, where do I do this? None. Does that work? No. Now it's green. That's very strange. I have no idea what happened. It did not happen during the technical check. I'm it's it's about. fine. You can keep it talking. It's fine. <laughs> All right. I will try to, to fix this uh, later. Um, where was I? So yes. So uh, lowering the voting age to 16, I think, is, is a very wonderful idea. And you should do it in Germany. And it should happen across uh, the EU because it does have a, a, an impact. But uh, as you said, and I don't want to disagree with this point at all, because I, I believe it should be very true. The voting age is not the main issue. It's uh, about the democratic participatory tools that are uh, available to the youth. And having a lower voting age just so happens to allow you to engage with the system earlier. But our institutions and our processes are quite outdated. They haven't been updated and reformed in quite a while. And things have changed. The way we consume news have, has changed. The way we consume and have access to information has changed. And that's where a lot of the distrust uh, stems from. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of more information uh, and transparency about the way that our governments and our political parties operate, what their uh, true intentions might be, which has this enfranchised, not just the youth, but also the older generation. And I think uh, I'd like to also respond to the very long comment by Mr. Croker. Uh, on, on the one hand, I, I fully agree we should not uh, exclude the older generations. I think this should be a, a conversation about a generational contract, which we've had before, and I believe it's been broken. And it's been broken by the previous generation, which is why there's a lot of distrust uh, between older uh, the older generation and 
the younger generation. Now, I don't think this is sustainable. I think we need a kind of resolution. We need reconciliation between younger and older generations only through cooperation and coexistence. Can we all ensure uh, you know, mutual success and mutual uh, happiness in life? But someone needs to extend an olive branch. And I believe it, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the youth, given that we are inheriting a real mess of a world. And it is absolutely not our fault. And we come into this world and we find out that we lack the tools to actually do anything about it. And whenever we do want any kind of tangible change, the older generation comes in and decides, well, why, why are you talking about this now? Why, why, are we, uh, why are we to give you something if things weren't better for us back then, even though perhaps they were? Uh, classic, uh, classical example, and I think this is the, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll let uh, the conversation continue, is uh, we were talking about reforming our military in Austria a couple of years back. Um, because if, if you don't know, we still have uh, conscription, so mandatory conscription for any uh, adult male 18 and up. Uh, and you have the choice to either go serve with the military or do what we call civil service, which is a social service where usually people work in ambulances or elderly care centers as I did and, and these kind of uh, things. And uh, there was a referendum on this issue and it was won by the older generation because of uh, the, the demographic um, state of play. And uh, the main arguments for it were, well, we used to have it, why should you not have it? And second of all, well, we can't afford to, to really finance our social systems. So the youth just has to do this for us because we deserve this. We already worked hard, so they have to do it for us. And this is the kind of uh, example where, where generational mistrust between younger and older generations are born from. So it's, it's a bit of a give and take. And if one generation takes too much, at some point, the other generation doesn't really want to participate anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and then I'll try to fix my camera. <laughs> Thank you so much. Petros, now it's your turn. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, first of all, uh, many thanks both to, to Miriam, but also Yanis for very interesting contributions. Uh, and also Jens and Dominic's comments that the problem coming after such knowledgeable speakers is that you are only left with the option to agree with everything that was said. And, and it's true, I'd like to echo to a large extent the points of the previous speakers. Uh, we also commissioned uh, opinion polls since 2019, and we also noticed across the board the disillusionment and a sense of disempowerment of citizens in all age groups. And, and that sense is higher in countries where um, authoritarianism or let's just say authority, more authoritarian leaders uh, take hold. Uh, so there's a close correlation between that sense of disempowerment and then the, the ability of populist authoritarian leaders to exploit that sense of disempowerment and alienation to gain power. And I think that's something that we should certainly keep in mind when we're discussing participation, because uh, again, as uh, Miriam's data showed, that is uh, more prevalent among younger people who feel um, a disengagement with democracy. And there are a variety of reasons for that, not because they necessarily feel um, against democracy, but because they, as other speakers said, they don't feel that democracy works for them, or at least the way democracy is currently run. And that brings me to my, to my one and main point, uh, that um, we need to really provide the, the space and the vehicles uh, to engage people in the decisions that affect them. And we've seen a resurgence of participatory and deliberative democracy across Europe, not least uh, through the recent conference on the future of Europe that the EU has been running. Uh, over 12 months, European as well as national citizens panels came together and put forward proposals about the future of the European Union, which were then discussed by a plenary of politicians, civil society, social partners, together with the citizens' representatives, and uh, came forward with very concrete and ambitious proposals. So uh, the experience uh, showed that when citizens are empowered uh, and they are involved, they really take hold of that. And um, all I, I will encourage you to read the conclusions of the Conference of the Future of Europe, 
because it really shows how much people feel uh, the desire to be involved in the decisions that affect them across the board on all policy areas, but also the way that they see cooperation, multilateralism, European integration, call it whatever you want, as one of the vehicles, if not the main vehicle, to address the issues that they, uh, they face. So there is an opportunity here to integrate this deliberative democracy into a representative democracy. One doesn't exclude the other, I should say. Uh, the two complement each other very strongly. Adding to that the role of organized civil society, social partners, and other stakeholders, then you can have a, a very powerful uh, method of ensuring that uh, citizens don't feel uh, simply consumers of democracy, where they're asked to vote every four years or every five years, but they actually feel like shareholders of our democracy because they have the opportunity to take part in, uh, in the deliberative uh, methods and processes that generate and produce decision making. And that can happen at the local, at the regional, at the national, and at the European level because the examples are there. And I think, again, the, the OECD has done significant work mapping out those different forms of deliberative and participatory democracy, and I think it's worth discussing it further. I will leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petrus. This is very indeed very important. And yesterday in our evening event, this this exactly this this topic was very uh, highlighted by the by the speakers. They were saying that uh, it's very important that we focus on what's happening beyond elections in terms of participatory mechanisms. So it is perfectly in line with what was said yesterday. Yanis, I will you raise your hand. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Petros, also for mentioning uh, another European dimension, uh, namely the um, Conference on the Future of Europe, which I think for from the perspective of youth and youth organizations was um, more like a mediocre um, structure or process, if I may say, um, uh, also in, uh, referring to Ms. von der Leyen's, um, let's say, surprising uh, uh, intervention about the European uh, Year of Youth, uh, where I think uh, apparently there was little concept given um, at the time when she was announcing it. Um, so overall, it felt really like that um, the institutions were developing all of these things as they go, which you can also, of course, see as a positive thing that they were open for suggestions and so on. But here it felt for me more like that they were a bit clueless uh, at times, um, um, uh, which uh, in the end also resulted in the fact that um, the European Youth Forum as the biggest youth uh, network in Europe had to really fight and uh, demand uh, one, one seat in the plenary of the conference, uh, which has hundreds of people. Uh, so there's a, a one formal seat for youth organizations uh, where, of course, yes, in the citizens panels, there is always one third of young people, but these were randomly selected, which I don't necessarily think is a bad idea. I agree that there is potential for uh, different uh, modes of democracy and democratic um, participa participation. We as a youth organization or youth parliament, we also use a lot of different methodology uh, and it's quite um, successful. However, in, in the end, it should be not about some symbolic uh, results and symbolic um, activities, uh, creating a very nice and, you know, uh, uh, visual uh, conference where you can take a lot of great pictures and uh, uh, disseminate them across Europe uh, or put people in front and, and have them um, speaking out their opinions. It's, it's now about what is the structural and uh, policy results of this. And I think, again, they uh, probably they didn't really even know what to do uh, for the day they were announcing this uh, paper. Uh, what will be next? Uh, for example, will we have a convention? Uh, will the governments actually really um, commit to what has been decided there? Um, will they follow the institutional um, uh, recommendations? And that's quite sad because then it can feel like uh, that uh, it was more of like a uh, exercise rather than uh, actual, um, uh, yeah, uh, 
progress or, or wish for progress from a broad, um, broad angle of people, institutions, and so on. And I think this is quite, uh, uh, quite symptomatic also for youth approaches that have been happening in the past. Uh, you do like little youth parliaments and the, or youth councils in cities, you uh, give them a little bit budget here and you put them on the front page of the local newspaper and yeah, and then that's about it. So I think uh, uh, just to refer back also to the question of um, voting age, um, I think voting age can be a very great tool. Uh, important is that we're not stopping at that, like that we, okay, now we have 16 year olds uh, voting across Europe or in, in, in the national kind of elections. Uh, that should be uh, about it. No, we're uh, young people can participate now. Isn't that great now? Uh, and I think that's very important to hold uh, um, everyone involved very much accountable. And very last point, I think this is also um, a good answer to the criticism that was in the chat, because if this is happening, this is also overall um, uh, con contributing to the quality of democratic processes uh, in the systems of national and uh, European level, uh, and would, of course, then also benefit uh, other generations. Thank you very much for this critical and very well elaborated uh, comments. Uh, Jens, it's your turn. Yeah, I would uh, definitely agree with that. Um, I think that, um, so just, just to be sure, I, I think we're, we're pretty much on the same page concerning uh, considering the, the voting age and that it would be um, better if it was lower. Um, but uh, I wanted to get back to the term that uh, Petros uh, used earlier, which was uh, shareholders of democracy. I actually really, really like that term um, because it kind of um, represents for me another issue. So apart from there not being enough or sufficient structures uh, to participate in the first place as a young person, um, I think we also need to work on the general, um, well, yeah, the, the general atmosphere of, of democracy and participating in it and uh, showing why it's important. So at least in Germany, I'm actually not quite sure about the other European countries, but I would guess that it's the same there. Um, younger people tend to have a lower voting participation in the elections. Um, so I guess it's probably the same in, in other European countries. And uh, part of that may be that, for example, um, things like uh, Europe or um, security in the first place or um, you know democracy have kind of been granted for many people that uh, grew up um, in at least countries like like Germany and um, they kind of grew up with that and so they took them for granted and only when there's a catastrophe happening like for example the Brexit or um, as we have now war um, we tend to um, realize how important it is that we that we secure those those things and what, that we actually have to work for them every day. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the other side of participation to kind of make visible um, what we're actually fighting for or why it's important to, to engage uh, yourself in democracy, in European democracy, in the fight against climate change and so on. And on the other side, uh, to show the possibilities of participation, to show how can I um, participate if I want to. So what we can see for, for ourselves and our party is that a lot of people that um, participate in the party uh, unfortunately joined um, during those times, during the election of Donald Trump, during um, the Brexit, um, during um, catastrophic news about climate change and um, that, yeah, I, I think we, we need to get to a process where people, uh, younger people tend to engage in politics um, if even if there's not a democracy, uh, not a, uh, even if there's not a catastrophe. Thank you, Jens. Uh, just to organize ourselves, we still have 15 minutes and we have four hands raised here. So I kindly ask you to be uh, a bit short, but everything will be fine. So Petros, it's your turn. No, I just like to uh, echo a little bit the criticism that Yanis uh, landed on the process. I think anyone who was involved in, I had the pleasure, let's say, to be a member of the plenary, and, uh, and I said a lot of the of the criticism there. But I'm also a more a half full kind of guy, and I think that you know, 12 months ago, the idea of uh, European citizens panels would have been unimaginable, let alone one that really puts forward recommendations that we're now working on towards making a reality. 
So I think we, we should take all that criticism because in many ways the conference was kind of a vehicle that was constructed as we were driving it down the road, which is a preposterous but very European thing to do. Nevertheless, you know, the European Parliament has now come forward and has requested formally, as the treaty is allowed, to trigger um, a convention. And it has even put forward the specific treaty amendments that the, the European Parliament will like to discuss in that convention. So with the intention of taking the recommendations and making those that require treaty change and making them a reality, which is a huge step. And the European Council has committed that they will discuss that idea now in June. So in very quick succession, the conference finished in May, the parliament came forward asking to trigger a convention and the European Council is discussing that. And, and member states are taking their positions. And of course there is uh, juggling and fighting between those that don't want change and those that do want change and those that are agnostic and that can be persuaded. And the European Commission, the third pillar in this equation have said that you know we are open to the idea of treaty change if uh, the member states in the European Parliament want it. And of course, on our side, European civil society, which was indeed very underrepresented, and you know, we worked closely with the European Youth Forum, and particularly the president, to ensure that the eight, nine people out of the 500 that were representing civil society really made the most of it. And I think we made quite a bit of noise in there on behalf of civil society. So all that to say that something that is imperfect can still be a revolution. And I think having those citizen panels and ensuring now that there is a follow-up and things happen uh, as a result of the recommendation is important. The, the, the crucial bit for me is not to throw away the baby with the bathwater, not to say that ah, this wasn't good enough because that gives a ammunition to others to say, right, then let's do it, let's not do it again. It's clearly failed. How can we improve it? All our criticism should be constructive and ensure that this happens again and it's better. It is a very good point. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this insight. Miriam, you are the next one. Yeah, no, I just wanted to react to, to Petro's comment earlier on OECD work on participation, transparency, and deliberative democracy that is done actually under the umbrella of our open government uh, work. Um, so there, there are, there's an OECD standard that is called open uh, government. And I really invite you to look at it because most of your countries have adhered to that. And they are also under reporting obligation towards this instrument. And you can see, and you can monitor progress over time. What we have also seen is uh, that some of the initiatives, uh, for instance, the open government partnership to probably you're aware of it, actually include some commitment specifically specifically on use, but only a few. I mean, we are really talking about a handful of, of countries. Um, and, and I think with the debate that we are currently seeing, especially when it comes to intergener intergenerational justice and that we have the first generation of young people that will be worse off in monetary terms than their parents, you will also probably see a push also to look at it more from the age length at uh, broader open government principles. Um, there's also a civic space observatory that is run by the OECD, just to reply also to Dominic uh, before, and I really invite you to look at it because it's the, you know, the OECD is the house of good practices and, uh, and you can see what other countries are doing uh, as they are facing the same uh, problem. One point on intergenerational uh, justice, equity or dialogue, and I saw the comment in, in the chat, um, indeed it's a bit, um, awkward to discuss uh, use without uh, talking about the elderly. It's a bit like talking about gender equality without really including also uh, men. But what is most mainly missing in the debate is not to look at it from ad hoc initiatives, uh, like we do, a, I don't know, intergenerational dialogue here, or we, um, we, we, uh, we uh, I don't know, we have a strategy there, but it's really to look at it from the policy, policy perspective that you have an administration and a government that is really devising policies that are there to stay to help you looking at the issues at stake from an intergenerational perspective. And I have tried in, the, in my presentation to point to some of these initiatives, policies, like in New Zealand or in the Netherlands, where they are really experimenting with that approach and which, which are um, also highly uh, promising. And in this regards, I also would like to really re-emphasize that the OECD is currently working on a recommendation instrument. It's a legal standard to which countries are adhering to um, on use empowerment opportunities. 
um, which also includes an intergenerational length. And if approved, and we hope that this will be the case, Minds and Tens June now uh, at ministerial level, then again, it can help you as uh, youth workers, as, um, uh, as policy makers, to, um, to have a guiding document, a kind of GPS on uh, where you would like to go uh, um, and what it takes to get there. And of course, to monitor progress over time, very important point that was also mentioned by Petros. Thank you, Miriam. Jana, you are the next one. Thank you. And I see that there's a lot of consensus in the room, um, but I, I would like to sort of bring again the focus to children, because we are always talking about youth today. And again, we cannot talk about youth without talking about what is happening in childhood. So I'm a little surprised that children explicitly haven't come much more into this conversation. And I think that's unfortunately also because there is a split between policies and the focus on children, early childhood, child well-being, and then the conversation around youth participation, youth empowerment. And we should not have that split. So what I also feel is that we're talking a, bit, a little bit about political and democratic life as being separate from the rest of life, which what we're saying in, child, in childhood is that unless you have education services, healthcare services, which are practicing a participatory and respectful approach to children, then you will not cultivate their engagement in whatever way or form in society, which then will have a negative impact on political and democratic life. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that the lens that we would come into this debate is somewhat missing from the conversation. And for, for us would be a value to put more prominently in what's happening in schools, what's happening in early childhood centers, what's happening to tackle inequality in childhood, investing in services that will ensure children have equal opportunities growing up. Um, so I think that that's the, the perspective that we would like to sort of balance in the conversation. Absolutely, this is this is indeed very important and very in line to what uh, the research community finds that uh, as soon as we invest in whatever uh, aspect of a child's life, it impacts in the behaviors over the life course, ending up in in old age poverty. So it's 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 the foundation, and it's indeed it's you are what we what you share here is exactly in line with the scientific evidence. I must say. So Dominique, you are the next one. And then we have only five minutes to conclude. So please be brief. I'll do my best. Uh, I, I hope the camera will, will stay fixed now. Um, yes, now I can see you. Yes, so uh, first of all, Jana, I, I fully agree. Uh, early childhood development is the key to the future development of the entire generation. What you learn, and how you interact with your environment or how your environment interacts with you does have defining impact on you later in life, including whether or not you'll be able to uh, truly be happy and find the kind of uh, fulfillment that you actually uh, deserve and are looking for, or whether or not you will have you know, unconscious biases and, and, and triggers that will hold you back your entire life. So, I, I do believe in that. But since I don't have a lot of time, I'm not going <laughs> to de debate you on this or, or, or talk too long about this now. I'm just going to uh, throw in one little tidbit uh, to, as food for thought for you, which is uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was around 2015, there was a study published, uh, the biggest, I think, to, to that date, the biggest generational uh, or youth study uh, that was ever conducted across Europe. It was called Generation What? Uh, it was conducted across all over Europe, uh, not just the EU, but including all EU member states. Uh, I think it was over a million uh, participants as well uh, across the EU, so it was quite a sizable portion. And if you look at the results, you can still find it online um, today. If you look at the results of the different uh, responses, there's differences, of course, between countries, but if you look at the aggregate results, uh, the majority of respondents, and they were, I think, asked age 15 till 25, or maybe it was 30, I'm not entirely sure, 
they uh, found that they do not trust the political system. They do not trust politicians. They do not trust religious institutions. However, they do trust caritative institutions. They even trust the police and to a lesser degree, the justice system. At the same time, if you look at, despite the fact that they uh, trust more uh, caritative uh, organizations and NGOs, if you look at how many are actively engaged in such organizations, it's about 6% of the respondents. However, over 70% said that they would be more than happy to eventually engage and volunteer for a cause they believe in. And that tells me one very important thing, which is that given the opportunity, given the right tools, the right channels through which the youth can engage with society, with the political system, they will do so. But we need to ensure that they have this level playing field and they have this access to these opportunities to express themselves and engage with the system. Thank you so much, Dominic. Yanis will be the, the last person to, to share here and then we'll finalize the, the session. So, so go ahead. Thank you, Daniela. Um, first to uh, respond to Yana, I, I think uh, what in fact would be a problem if we now like look at uh, institutions, um, what they should do about youth and implementing some of the uh, uh, some structural changes, think what they would not, um, they would not function, they would not get to good results if we're all not looking at the entire education system and entire uh, how young people are up, uh, brought up, because and then they're they have never been properly uh, brought in touch with uh, how do I take part in society I'm actually asked what I want uh, and we would kind of like uh, just not deal with the uh, root causes I think that's in fact something that we should uh, take into consideration but I think it was also uh, uh, a choice to like focus this topic a little bit um, uh, and to Dominic uh, yes I think what we're missing is a, a society that actually um, values and um, welcomes uh, um, proper engagement for, for the society, for uh, taking the time to, to either, you know, help your neighbors or be engaged in politics and so on and so on. Um, so we are always doing a lot of symbolic things like thinking and uh, saying, oh, that's a great, uh, great thing that you do that. But we do little uh, in terms of what the education systems, um, what the workplaces do, and so on. So I think that's also another structural key to uh, actually bring the participation, whatever system we put, if it's deliberate or a representative, to actually come to the potential that it might have if we don't change the structural aspects around it. And that's kind of leading me to the, to the last point uh, as a response to Petros. I agree very much. We should take those uh, positive aspects of the conference uh, on the future of Europe and really like cherish them and also um, uh, to not uh, diminish the work that has been done. But I, what I'm just afraid is that we're running into the same problems again and again, and that there is no systemic learning in the institutions that you cannot build those things on the go and that you cannot just realize that there is young people suddenly and that you have to somewhat include them <laughs> and that you do that in the next situation again and again. And I think what really was really uh, eye-opening for me was that uh, a lot of young uh, youth organizations were invited last year uh, to be confronted with this new Together EU platform and how you could use that and that, youth that there would be input needed. And then all of the youth organizations there were like, well, we have the input. We work with young people every day. We can give you right now. And then there was the response from the institutions. Oh, no, no, we want it in the platform. Can you please bring young people, put it in the platform? And that's like, I was really shocked by that because we, we, we always ask for the problems again and again, but we are aware what are the problems. So it would be great that we can now start to work on the systemic change that is needed. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all participants in the session. I'm very, very grateful to all the richness of what you have shared and uh, hope to see you soon somewhere, not online, 
And I hope you keep uh, enjoying the Berlin Democracy Days. Now we'll have a 15 minutes break and then the next session will start, we'll, we'll start again. Bye-bye.